Alright, so I just got done watching two documentaries and I uh, thought I would maybe share my thoughts on these. Um, these documentaries were called To Make a Farm and Fresh. And they're both available on uh, Amazon Prime if you have that. Um, they're also available, you know, various other ways, you know, maybe a couple less than legal ways through torrents and things, but if you're able to watch those two, I highly suggest them. Um, let me start off by uh, reading a quote from one of the movies or the documentaries, and that quote is, when it is understood that one loses joy and happiness in the attempt to possess them, the essence of natural farming will be realized. The ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. Now, I believe that the uh, the woman got the quote from a Japanese fellow, but, uh, you know, it... it, it drives the point home nonetheless so um, it really kinda messes up my mind and um, it just amazes me what we as Americans and modern society as a whole are okay with to eat to put into our body and uh, I'm not any better than any one of you. Let me get that out of the way right now. You know, I, I eat fast food just like everybody else. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of money to go to, you know, buy all organic stuff. And, you know, when I go to Walmart or, you know, wherever I go, um, local grocery store to buy groceries, I don't necessarily look at ingredients or, you know, um, what the best for me would be, I look at the stinking price tag, you know, and that, and that's, that's where a lot of the problems come in, because, for example, like the, the large corn farmers, you know, the farmers that just have acres and acres of, of corn, and, you know, they crop dust, and it's GMO, or, you know, whatever, um, but large-scale operations like that, where they grow, you know, one specific crop, uh, corn in particular, all the resources and money that go into all the equipment and everything to plant and uh, harvest all that corn, um, all the pesticides, the seeds, the man hours, you know, the fuel, all of the cost that goes into it, um, when that corn farmer sells that crop of corn, he doesn't even break even. He sells it at a loss. The only, the only reason why they do it is because the government writes them a check, a subs subsidy check at harvest time or whatever to make up the difference. If, if those farmers were going on their own merit alone, they would lose money and go out of business. It's only because of the government subsidies that they're able to make a living at it. And again from the from the uh, documentaries 70 percent of all that corn and soybeans being you know those two being the most you know um, predominant crops the soybeans and the and the corn 70 percent of that stuff does not even go to human consumption you know the the corn goes for for fuel and animal feed and you know the soybean gets made into you know oil and um, put into animal feed also so seventy percent of all all those crops we're not even eating in the first place you know um, and not only that but having you know, acres and acres and acres of one specific crop is not good. I don't know where exactly we made the shift 
and stopped using our minds, okay? Look at me. I'm I'm a normal dude. I, you know, I don't I, I'm just a guy. I, I'm not smart by a long shot. You know, I'm, I'm one of the dummies, I guess. But I mean, all you have to do is just look at nature. Just look at, look at what nature does and then try to copy that. I mean, you know, there, there's arguments even that could say, you know, people should not even really do farming. You know, that uh, we're the only animal that has to do work, basically. You know, every other animal on Earth, their only job, so to speak, is to stay alive. And a lot of people could say that that should be our only concern. You know, we shouldn't even build houses. We shouldn't stay in one spot. We should constantly migrate and move in herds. But, you know, I won't go down that path. Although it probably, you know, scientifically and actually probably is correct. But we won't we won't go down that path. But even if you carve out, you know, a 200 acre, you know, existence or a two acre existence or whatever, whatever you make for yourself, you know, you can try to emulate, you can tame the wild, you know, you can take a pig and keep it in captivity, but at the same time try to make it as close to the natural habitat as possible. You know, in nature you don't see 2,000 acres of corn. You know, there would be trees and thistles and, you know, every other kind of, you know, edible plant and and things growing in it. And there, you know, you wouldn't see just rows and rows and rows and rows of one thing. What do, what do they call it? I think they call it a monoculture, where you're just taking... The same thing goes with livestock, you know, all the beef farmers and everything. If you just have, you know... 2,000 beef cows slammed into a feedlot, you know, that causes disease and all kinds of bacteria and all kinds of waste problems, sanitary problems. It's just, it's not good. But, you know, if, if you take and migrate your cats, let's say you have 200 acres, okay? Um, well, actually, let's go for an exactly, an exact personal um, example, my uncle, uh, the one that I did the video on a while back where I called them the true homesteaders, um, my uncle has 160 acres and has since 1969 is when he bought it. It used to be a tree farm and he had about 30 head of cattle. He had about six pigs uh, a few donkeys or mules for a while, um, about 25 chickens, and I'd say 25 to 30 goats. And uh, you wouldn't see him just take all of those animals and just shove them off into a corner, you know, and just keep them there and just let them wallow in their own filth and slam them all together and try to force feed them to get them to fatten up as quick as possible with steroids and antibiotics and all this stuff. If you watch those two documentaries, what you'll see is all of these people who are, you know, m constantly moving their animals. You know, you section off into paddocks or whatever, whatever, whatever you want to call it, just separate fields. You know, let your cows go in a 30 or 40 acre, you know, plot for, you know, two or three days and then move them over one section. And when you move them over one section, then you bring the next, you know, say goats, bring the goats in there. Or no, actually, you wouldn't do the goats now. You do chickens, you know, put some, ch put, put chickens in that field. They'll scratch up the poop and spread it out and eat all the little bugs and fly larvae and all that stuff that's in there. And, you know, and they won't really mess with the grass too much and uh, it gives it a chance to kind of revegetate. Then you move the next, you know, you just keep moving them, moving them around, you know, in nature, an animal does not just pick one spot and just stay there most of the time. You know, the, the buffalo, the cows, you know, the horses, you know, just about any thing you can think of, 
moves. It migrates. It, it doesn't stay in one spot. It, it constantly is on the move. And, you know, it leaves behind its waste and, you know, there's nothing really that, co that comes along except for, say, birds. You know, naturally in nature, behind herds of buffalo or, or, or cows or what have you, the birds will always follow the herds. And, th and that's why you would put, you know, say chickens right right in behind, you know, the the cows or whatever like that. The birds always follow the herds wherever they went. They were The birds were always a day or two behind. And that's because, of, you know, they scratch around in the poop and, and eat all the stuff. So, but nature has a way of taking care of all this stuff. You see, it all comes down to to the natural way of things. You know, you don't just... I mean, I, I might burn a few bridges here, I don't know, but you, you, really, you shouldn't take a 10-acre farm or a 2- or 3-acre farm and slam a bunch of, you know, goats and chickens and cows and, you know, lambs and all this stuff into small... You know, the these kind of hippy-dippy people... They, they like to show their green pastures, and, and all that's fine and dandy, but, I mean, you know, in nature, that stuff doesn't happen. You don't, you don't keep, you know, that many animals confined. Even if you can make it work, it, it, it's probably just not a good idea because of disease and things like that. But, um, I don't know, just... To me, it seems to make more sense to emulate what naturally occurs and try to provide that for the animal. And not only that, but, but what are these people feeding these cows? You know, cows in nature do not eat other cows. They don't eat meat. Look at what, look at what the food that's going into these cows. It's got bone marrow. It's got, you know, remnants of dead cows and... You know, all they're they're feeding cows to cows basically, and it. You know, I don't know. I don't know about all that crap. I I don't know why it's necessary. It's you know. They're saying they like to say that the small farm cannot feed the world, you know, and that's just that's total garbage. There's no way. We do have a large population, and a large population of people live in big cities and things where they can't farm for themselves. Okay, number one, too bad, don't live there. What's the point of living in a city? So you can have high-tech jobs and, you know, who needs those high-tech things? I mean, yeah, computers are fun. You know, the Internet's, all, you know, fun and all that stuff, but do we need it? Really? I mean, do we need it? I mean, it, it, it's nice, for example, for me with the YouTube thing, I'm getting in contact with all of you people from, you know, way out, Canada, uh, Australia, Pennsylvania, you know, all these far-off places that I normally would not have contact with okay but how many people live within 10 miles of me right now that I could form actual physical face-to-face -face, you know friendships and working relationships with that I don't contact because it's so easy to to not we isolate ourselves and then only reach out when we want to and you've got all kinds of people with psychological issues of like, you know, um, paranoia and um, all kinds of social anxiety where, where people can't stand to be around people. You know, if I, I can't stand it. I, if I go to Walmart and somebody bumps into me, I am mad the rest of the day. I cannot stand to be slammed up with, you know, a whole bunch of other people. I mean, I'm, I've, I've known some old farmer type guys that only went to town once a month, if that. My uncle, he they only go to town maybe twice a month. But when they do go to town for, say, maybe a livestock auction or something like that, 
they'll go into the crowd and they'll socialize with, you know, every Tom, Dick, and Harry and, hey, how's it going? Yeah, I've known that guy for 42 years and, hey, how so-and-so? And they're scrunched right up against other people and I'm sitting over here in the corner like twitching and trying to scratch and claw to get out of there and they're just having a great time. You know, so just because... Just because you want to live in the country and and farm and things like that doesn't mean that all of those people are hermits and don't like people. You know, I mean, if anything, people that live in cities are less sociable than the people that live in rural areas. Okay? I mean, I, I was a truck driver. I've been to every large, you know, major city in the United States. I've been there. I've been everywhere. I've been to all 48 continental United States, Canada, and Mexico. And every time I go to, say, a plastics bottling company or, or some sort of, you know, uh, say, like a poultry processing plant that's like, way out in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas, those shippers and receivers are the nicest people. And then you go to Dallas to, you know, some paper factory or, you know, go to the Dallas airport, Dallas Fort Worth airport or something like that to pick up a FedEx load. Those people are just the nastiest, most hateful people. You just want to punch them right in the face. So, I mean, you know, while it's nice to communicate with everyone over large distances, do we really need it? It's not, you know. The my point is the people that live in cities, if they can't feed themselves, is that really the farmer's responsibility in Oklahoma to give up, you know, 200 years of family tradition of of farming with, you know, a lot of these farmers that have these huge fields, you know, of corn or soybean, they used to be regular smaller farmers. You know, their family, their fathers, their grandfathers, they had, you know, beef, cattle, they had, you know, pigs, chickens, you know, they they grew vegetables, all that stuff. They've just flattened all that land out and now they just plant corn. And that's all that they do. You know, how much of that family tradition and knowledge and and all that are just flushed down the toilet? And on top of that, they're not even making any money doing it. They're, it costs more to grow the stuff than what they can sell it for. That's why they have government subsidy checks. Or else they'd go bankrupt. And it, it's, it's completely our fault. It said that four companies, I don't know if the, it's down to three yet or not, but four companies provide like 80% of the beef for the entire country. So 80% of the hamburger that you buy at the store comes from one of these four companies for the entire United States. Now that that seems kind of, kind of strange. I mean, I... I why does it have to be like that? It it does not have to be like that. I'm you know. I personally know, at least. Maybe it's just the area I live in, you know. But, uh, my wife's dad, you know, my uncle, my wife's dad is, uh, he's kind of a recreational beef farmer, you know. He's got maybe a hundred between a hundred and two hundred head of beef cattle. And, uh, but they're, they're not fed like, you know, all of the weird feeds and stuff like that. They're just basically on grass and hay. But, um, <clears throat> and like my uncle, you know, that 160 acre farm, not only did it feed himself and my aunt, they, they never had children, but it fed him and my aunt, um, off and on, he would have grandchildren stay there. I lived there for two years when I was a teenager. Um, you know, he all he he had a garden that was about three times bigger than the one that I've got now. 
it was about this it's about the same width but it's probably about three times longer and he just grew all kinds of stuff and and grew enough to last you know the entire year not like I'm doing but he grew enough food to last him you know an entire year to the to the next harvest to where if he wanted to you know obviously he still went and bought cookies and you know different flour and stuff like that from the grocery store but technically if he didn't want to go to the grocery store he would never have had to you know 160 acres 30 head of beef cattle okay about 30 chickens 25 or 30 chickens 25 or 30 goats you know maybe at times between four and ten figs okay and and the vegetable garden and just from that alone he not only was able to feed himself and his wife through the entire year but also was able to make a living at it and didn't have to have a job outside the farm and that that's not something that happened fifty years ago I'm talking, he pro he just sold his cap. He's like 74 years old now. You know, he, he's not getting around as well as he once did. He's in, still in pretty good health, but um, he just sold off the last of his cows like, I don't know, three or four years ago. And up until three or four years ago, it was still enough for him to actually make a living doing it. I mean, they live old style, you know, their electric bill was like 40 bucks a month or something like that, and they didn't have a heat bill or anything because they cook and uh, heat with wood, but, and in the summertime they have like a little propane, a, well not a little, a normal sized propane stove, and they just run a gas line outside the house to a big like acetylene tank full of propane, that's what they use in the summertime to cook, but and she still uses a ringer washer to this day uh, they don't own a dryer they never did that I know of but uh, but anyway you you can make a living not only can you provide enough food for yourself and your family but you can make a living and not have to have a job or anything outside the farm you know the government is making it a little harder to do things like that now but it can still be done. Those days are not gone. Everybody likes to think back, you know, oh, I wish it was, you know, 1860 again or 1950 or, you know, something like that. But it, it it's not it's not gone. It's still here. You just have to, you know, you just have to do it. Now, I think that's the problem with a lot of people nowadays, including yours truly, is you like to sit around, we like to sit around and think about how we would like something to be, but don't do anything to make it that way. You know, you can s slam your fist down on the table all day long and say, I don't want to pay property taxes, it's not right. Okay, do something about it. What are you going to do? I mean, every everything has to start somewhere. Somebody has to start everything, so... You know, if something bugs you enough, just get up and do something. Do one one thing. You know, write one letter to a congressman or a senator or, or, you know, whatever. Just anything. Anything is better than nothing. You never know what's going to come of it. Probably nothing, but who knows. The same thing with the farming thing, you know. Of course, land is expensive now, you know, for... I mean, you're going to spend... Depending on the area, around here you could get like a 10-acre parcel of land for probably fifteen or 20000 And with the value of our dollar the way it is, fifteen or 20000 really isn't that much money anymore. It is to me because I'm broke, but anyway. So, yeah, obviously, you know... In 1969, my uncle said that he bought that 160-acre plot, the hundred, the whole 160 acres with a house already on it and everything. Um, the house was there. Uh, the, the log cabin part was there. If you haven't watched that video about, you know, the real homesteaders or whatever, go watch that. It's 
you know, it's neat. But, um, and I plan on doing another video with them in the future, because they're just, they're too good to pass up. They're the awesomest people that I've ever known of, and they live closer to, you know, the way it should be than I, than anybody else I even know of. Um... But anyways, so, you know, the house was there, the uh, the log building shed thing that used to be a general store was there, and the 160 acres, and he's got two natural springs, one of which is right behind the house that actually has like a spring house built around it where the, you know, the homesteaders or whoever got their water from, you know, they piped it right out of the ground. And uh, and it still runs today. And he's got a a creek that runs through the property, and and that's about it. But anyway, so the 160 acres, a house with a spring right behind the house, and a, a log cabin shed building type of thing. And he paid $2,500 for it in 1969. Obviously, you're not going to buy 160 acres for 2,500 bucks now, but I mean, you know, with, with the way the dollar is valued and everything, it's probably not that much different now. And the more land you buy, the cheaper it is per acre. So, you know, for the for all the people who are getting these, you know, loan, construction loans to build, you know, $200,000 houses, how much property would that $200,000 buy? You know, if you're able to borrow $200,000 to build a house, on your line of credit, then you can borrow $150,000 to buy, you know, 100 acres of land. And you can get 150 acres around here for, you know, $1,000 an acre. You know, that's not something that's over, that's, that's here. And uh, you can still make a living on a small farm. And I'm not talking you have to have 150 acres, I'm not saying that. You know, you could have you know, I, I wouldn't think, I mean, I don't know, but I wouldn't think anything smaller than 10 acres you could really make a lot of money off of to where you could, you know, only do that and not have an outside job. But I, I'm thinking if, if you had 10 acres and, and you cut back on your lifestyle a little bit, you know, like I said, you know, my uncle's electric bill is like 40 bucks a month, so... You know, if you, you know, if you want to live modern, you're going to have to work modern. So, just keep that in mind. But, I'm getting, I'm going all over the place with this video. So, I just wanted to talk to you guys for a minute. I saw those documentaries and it just got my wheels to turn in. And, I just thought I would maybe talk to you guys about it for a minute. And, see what you all think about it. So, I guess that's it.